sex. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the birds and the bees, doing the nasty, getting down and dirty, all of the metaphors for sex, just, just all of them. Sex has always had a place in art, whether it's through professions of enjoyment, disdain, disinterest, and so on. Whether we're talking cave paintings, or Roman pottery paintings, or modern art paintings. So it's almost universal in the history of art, right? In Japan, Article 175 of the country's penal code outright bans obscene materials. The history of sex on film in Japan, thus, is a lengthy and bizarre one, perhaps beginning in earnest with pink film, or pinku ega, a product of the 1960s, and a genre which continues to this day. Pink film is the answer to the question of how pornography can thrive in a place where it is basically illegal. The premise of the genre is simple to tantalize an audience without actually showing any penetration on screen, since that would constitute an illegal act. It's what you get when you remove the porn from a pornographic film, aka an o-graphic film. But it hasn't always been easy to work in Pink Ega. The genre began rather explosively in 1962 with the release of Flesh Market, directed by Satoru Kobayashi. The film caused such a sensation for its lewd nature that all prints of the film were seized by police within two weeks of its first screening. Today, the 49-minute film survives in an archival 21-minute segment. As the years wore on, Pink Ega became more of a standard than an outlier. In fact, Pinku Ega became so big so quickly that one of the country's largest production houses, Nikatsu, essentially converted itself into a Pinku Ega producing machine. Some will argue that Nikatsu's Roman porno films produced between 1971 and 1988 aren't true pink films, but they existed thanks to the same pressures and undercurrents which created the pink genre. Moves like this meant that Japan's technically not porn industry wasn't relegated to indie, low-budget fare, but that many of its crown jewels were actually porn spectaculars framed as high-budget period pieces. It's in this way that a Western audience may look at something like today's subject, Tokyo Decadence, and see merely a softcore BDSM porno flick, when in actuality it's a hardline pink film hailing from a long tradition of softcore porn being written, directed, and treated as mainstream. The man behind Tokyo Decadence, Ryunosuke Murakami, was born February 19, 1952, in Sasebo, Nagasaki, also home to a large U.S. naval base. As a teenager, he grew to sympathize with the hippie movement, and began making films. He also barricaded his school rooftop with several classmates, in a manner similar to anti-Vietnam protests occurring at the time in universities across America and Japan. You might recognize him better by his chosen name, Ryu Murakami, as the popularly translated but unrelated Murakami other than Haruki. Murakami was enrolled in sculpture at Masashino Art University in Fusa, Tokyo in 1972, where he began writing fiction in his off time and published his debut novel, Almost Transparent Blue, in 1976. Later, Murakami was quoted as saying that the biggest impact of winning this award at such a young age was that it allowed him to become financially independent and not reliant on the traditional system of employment. Murakami's work has often been noted as violent and sexual in nature. In keeping with these interests, in 1988, Murakami put together a collection of stories centered around prostitutes, titled Topaz. When it was adapted to film in 1991, the name remained in Japan. In the US, it was named Tokyo Decadence, with other territories adopting this name except Hong Kong, which took sex streams of Topaz, and Argentina with esclavas, meaning slaves in Spanish. Now, before we jump in, we gotta clear something up, because I know someone will say something if we don't. Hell, someone will probably say something anyway, but here goes. Supposedly, a 135-minute version of Tokyo Decadence exists. However, the longest version known in the West is 113 minutes. The film was distributed in the United States theatrically by Northern Arts Entertainment in 1993, then by Triborough and Image on VHS and Laserdisc, and rated NC-17 throughout. These versions were substantially cut down to around 90 minutes, a practice Triborough was noted for at the time. However, Cinema 
Epoch re-released the film on DVD in 2008, restoring the full 113-minute film. The 135-minute version has thus never surfaced. Additionally, the Cinema Epoch version was confirmed to be the uncut version by Nicholas Rucka, the author of the DVD liner notes. So today, we'll be talking about the 113-minute version of Tokyo Decadence that is readily available. And if anyone has the Holy Grail 135-minute version, let me know, because we've got like five bucks and a half-full jar of peanut butter, if you want to trade. So on to Esclavas, or Topaz, or Sex Dreams of Topaz, or Tokyo Decadence. The film centers around the life and times of Ai, a call girl who specializes in BDSM activities. Over the course of Tokyo Decadence, she encounters rich men who want to watch her dance in hotel windows, mini-golf playing goons who want to drug her up, a man who wants her to pretend to be a corpse, and a dominatrix named Saki who, in some ways, teaches Ai how to be herself. In this bright world of late 80s Tokyo, Ai inhabits the seedy underbelly populated by dark hotel rooms, back alleys, and the occasional fortune teller played by a major abstract artist. Through Ai's interactions with the men and women of this world, we learn how she serves an important function. These people, particularly the men, portray themselves as one thing in public, yet allow their true desires to run wild in private. I is, in this way, simultaneously something of a therapist and a receptacle for all of metropolitan Japan's cultural waste. In order for the world to continue succeeding and going up and up and up, someone needs to act as something of a janitor for those at the top. While it may be completely on the down low, I is essential for the function of this society, and, well, there's a reason for that. Tokyo Decadence came about at a very special time in Japanese history. It was released just as Japan was entering one of its biggest financial crises ever. So where films like Battle Royale or Suicide Club can offer insight into the aftershock of this crisis, Tokyo Decadence gives us a view from in the moment. We see the carefree attitude of the previous years echoed in Saki singing karaoke using a vibrator. Her choice of song, Koi no Vacants, was a pop number by the Peanuts, a pair of identical twins whose fame peaked in the 1960s, just when Japan was entering its largest period of economic growth in recent history. History. Amidst the grime and opulence of the late 80s, this woman, an unremitting heroin user, looks back to the glory days to find happiness. Equally important to understanding the subtext of Tokyo Decadence as when it was made is by whom it was made. Tenmei Kano, who appears as the man asking Ai and her partner to strangle him in one of the film's funniest moments, is best known as a photographer. A photographer arrested for obscenity in 1995 for nude photos in his book Kikuze 2, as well as his magazine The Tenmei. He has been pushing the boundaries of Japan's obscenity laws since the 1970s. Yayoi Kusama, who portrays the fortune teller that instructs Ai at the beginning of the film, is a visual artist working since 1957, mainly in sculpture and painting. Even if you don't know her by name, you might know her style. Andy Warhol borrowed her technique of identical photos, while Kleis Oldenburg borrowed her style of soft sculpture. Not to mention that in recent years, at least in the United States, Kusama has been enjoying something of a renaissance. Kan Mikami is a folk singer-songwriter, who is particularly popular in the 1970s. Masahiko Shimada, who plays Ai's first client in the film, was an author for decades before production of Tokyo Decadence. Shimada was quoted in an interview as describing the losing parties of World War II as political and cultural masochists where said losing parties partake in a form of masochism by apologizing and surrendering to the victors, yet being allowed by their victors to prosper as rewards for said masochism. Most of these actors share something. They're underground or boundary-pushing artists, and non-actors, most having only one or two other credits to their name in film. Their characters also share this. They're broken or experiencing some turmoil thanks to past wrongs or the economic downturn. The backdrop of BDSM pervading the film, while perhaps meant to indicate the fate of the entire country's cultural masochism as Shimada described, can also be used to explain these very real characters' own neuroses, and their needs to express or remove said neuroses from themselves. 
Whether it is Shimada himself asking to be choked, or Mikami asking to rape Ai, these characters are portrayed as troubled and in need of a release. This is because, as many practitioners of kink may tell you, BDSM can serve as both an emotional and physical catharsis. Through these characters, Murakami is exploring the needed release of Tokyo's pent-up populace. Murakami, given his relatively early success and vocal appreciation of the opportunity to break from a system which he sees as quelling the individual, seems apt and willing to detail the lives of people wronged by the same system. And who better to staff this tale than others trying to operate outside of the system? Of this phenomenon, Murakami has said, quote, for some reason, the concept of the individual didn't exist in Japan. Maybe it was because, in the rush to modernize, too much emphasis was placed on creating a sense of national unity, or maybe it was because of a lack of racial, religious, or linguistic diversity. But the question of the individual's role in society can only arise if the society has the concept of individual. Since there is no such concept here, really, the question itself doesn't come up." End quote. Usually, the main characters in Murakami's works are bad people, but involuntary heroes. Anti-heroes, even. He uses characters as hyperbolic versions of reality to portray what happens when one tries to be part of society, specifically Japanese society, and retain their individuality, leading to extreme cases of sex and violence in his works. In Tokyo Decadence, he seems to be exploring this confusing lack of identity that he perceives post-war Japan to have, as well as the vitriol felt by its citizenry as they grapple with the ideas of the individual in a collective society. Thematically, Murakami commonly discusses rebellion and isolation, using violence and sex to explore these themes. He focuses on individuality within what many see as a homogeneous society. He states, quote, in my novels, instead of being too introspective, I need something powerful like sex, violence, or drugs to banish that inward-looking mentality. Rage is important. It is a vital component of my novels. But even if you're angry and you throw a Molotov cocktail in the street, nothing will change. It is very difficult for a youth to know where to target their anger." End quote. It's in thoughts like this that we find another explanation beyond simply the crumbling economic state as to why these characters abuse themselves and others via power, money, sex, and drugs. None of them feel that they have individual identities. Ai's first client fields a business phone call during their session, and speaks in a manner not dissimilar to how he speaks with his wife later on, cold and unaffected. These characters recognize that they are publicly meant to act as a part of something bigger than themselves, and it's only through these moonlit interactions that they can release all of their inner demons and show what they're really made of. The film is full of a cast of underground artists, non-actors playing the parts of actors as anyone partaking in such a rigid system becomes an actor, by necessity. In their daily lives, they must put away their individual selves and portray the characters they have been cast as. And within the film, we're seeing the behind-the-scenes footage where the only one acting, the only one still taking part in that system and not thinking she is operating outside of it, is perhaps I, if we're to believe that she is, indeed, acting. As you can see, Tokyo Decadence is worth a watch, whether for cultural interests or for more lewd interests. There's a bounty of depravity to be had in the Tokyo Decadence franchise, with two pseudo-sequels being released in 1994 and 2007, and some of the original story collection being translated into English in 2015. But hey, wasn't there another book too? Yeah, that's right, Topaz 2. And only a year or two after it was published, didn't it get adapted into a film too? Oh yeah, Love and Pop. And wasn't it directed by... Oh no. Well, that's a story for another day. For now though, 